welcome back for part two of the very first Levity Zone Salon held back in December of 2013 at Ancient Oaks Farm. Part one in the last podcast saw a spirited discussion of how one might integrate powerful visionary experiences into daily life. Now, yours truly, Dr. Bruce, discusses his attempts at personal integration as guided by the teachings of Eckhart Tolle and J. Krishnamurti. Dr. Bruce then muses on the prospects of spiritual and conscious inquiry in a world of monstrous modernization in China and elsewhere, while Mikey challenges the notion that it was any easier to attain conscious elevation in the time of the Buddha than today. We then turn to the night's most important topic, brought in by Travis our heartfelt young friend who is beginning a career in counseling kids in elementary schools. Travis shared his heartbreak and frustration with what he sees happening to these kids, especially around powerful prescription drugs given to way too many of them, putting them into a manic monkey mind state of consciousness. The medicating of generations of youth by mental health professionals with the support of parents and school authorities may be altering the future of human consciousness and the very world in which we will all live. I turned on my boombox the other day doing my yoga and instead of my yogic music was Eckhart Tolle. I don't know how he slipped in there, but it was like the whole, his reading of the new earth. And frankly, you know, I sort of found his readings to put me to sleep. But I said, there's a reason why. So I sat down in the deep dish round chair there and started listening. And he was speaking directly to where I was after this experience in Peru. Like I didn't do the yoga for two days. I just simply deeply absorbed what this guy was saying. And it was, you know, really profound. If you're constantly in the mind and the ego is constantly running around in circles and your mind is thinking the circular thought thing. I call them no-ops, like software running no-ops or running no-ops, <laughs> no-ops, no-ops. And all that noise is going on. Except they're often a lot more, creating a lot more turbulence and negative consequences than, than the, no-ops. Then are, yeah, pure no-ops you'd actually would, would want. Yeah, no-ops, right. <laughs> yeah, there's no-ops and there's no-ops. But what the whole thing was that really it's a dichotomy there. There are two sides. If you're in that mental state of figuring out and frustrations and ego things and boredom things and cycling and cycling and cycling, you're in that state, which is most people, or he basically saying, still that, go down, get through to the immensity that can then open up. That's reality. That's connectedness. And so his whole call is come from there, go there, train yourself to go there. More often, watch watch the mind and the ego. They're gonna they're gonna co-opt that experience and take it back up to their level, you know, take its energy, and you train and you retrain and you retrain, and now you're coming from down here. And what he's really saying is, if you want a new earth, you gotta have as many people as possible go down in, come from there, experiencing that opening, and come from there, you know. And uh, I've been hanging around the Krishnamurti Library in in Ojai which I lived next to for five years, but was closed because he had died. I finally started going through J.K.'s writings and stuff. and he had Basically, at the end of his life, he said, I don't want any institutes formed. I don't want the words to be taken forward because words will poison. When I'm gone, I want this whole thing to just disappear. He basically, on his deathbed, said, look, mostly this has been a failure. You know, people are still coming to me with the same questions, even with within the the whatever you would call them, disciples. It's really the guru circuit. Yeah, and he never wanted that. Of course, he was the original no, person to reject yeah. that. Truth is a pathless land. Truth is a pathless land. But it was very ironic sitting in the middle of this library where he used to live, and there was a discussion group that I joined, and none of the lessons had been learned. It was a great big mind debate it went on that whole Saturday night. It's like. Wow, he was right. There's, there's absolutely nothing has gone forward from from that. So I'm circling back here that as we sort of attack the problems of the world all with mind and all with figuring out, we probably will never, never do it. Because 
you're tilting at a very powerful windmill, which is everyone else's mind. When everyone else's mind, ego, deviousness, creativeness, panic, anxiety, your mind is tilting at that windmill. And that windmill has been winning for a long time. It, that windmill has rolled itself over the whole planet. You know, in China, the couple times I've been there in the last few years, there's a billion people that joined that world, that moved from rice paddy villages. One billion people moved into manufacturing, housing, working in office jobs and what, whatnot, in full glee to get out of their rice paddy village, which meant getting up at 3.30 in the morning to basically weed individual tillers and do the math and make rice paddy production work when you're living with two billion people next to you. And they went fully to live above the shopping mall, to live in that shopping mall, to go to that office was like the best thing. So a billion people have just saturated themselves into steel and concrete that weren't there 15 years ago. It's a massive change. That change is so big, it, it renders invisible the number of people who are attempting, say, here on the West Coast to you know, live in a more balanced way. I mean, that number is gigantic. That's a, a seventh of the world's population just shifted. So these are like the big things. So they've moved into a world of completely mind, a completely consumerist society, completely material society, like I saw in India, Pakistan. Do you think that um, so, so your point that the um, that there is this shift towards what you call materialism or mind, what what gives you the impression that going from that rice paddy work before to to mm -hmm. the city life is such a fundamental shift in that in that sort of underlying quality of consciousness? There was one flight I took to Beijing where there was this rice paddy village, and I looked down. They're building a magnetic levitation train. There it was, and the train went over a major river, and it turned to avoid this village. There's the village, and there's its rice paddies, and there's the six or seven houses. And I thought, okay, the reality, and you talk to people in China who have gone through this transition, they were connected with the diurnal cycle. Mm -hmm. They were really connected with the state of nature, the weather. Um, they didn't have reading lights, so they went to sleep you know, when it was dark. There was learning, but it was Maoist-type education. But then there was some Confucian education. It was a pretty simple life. But they generally would sit around and talk about family histories and really kind of more fundamental things. When the young girl who's now working in the office in Shanghai goes back, all she's talking about is this handbag uh, how much money she's made because she's actually funneling money this to the village. The history of the world. I mean, you know, the the guys that are using plows to plow their fields. When you give them a tractor, they're like, "Holy right. shit, this is incredible!" You know, yeah. look what I can do. And I don't have to kill myself in order to do it. And so, you know, mm -hmm. and the genie's out of the bottle. The genie's out of the and bottle. And there's also a pattern of romanticizing those earlier or more primitive times. I, I, we do it at macro and micro levels constantly and from a moment to moment scale to a year to but, year scale. But I believe what he's saying is yeah. true that there are connections to the to the <clears throat> earth, to the natural I, patterns that I agree exist. also with I agree also with that and, and I guess I'm kind of playing devil's advocate because I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I, I also think that there can be that romanticizing that comes along with it in terms of um, not necessarily the um, connection to nature, but this <clears throat> deeper um, state of consciousness that you're talking about, which is what you're seeing as being pushed out when someone goes into a more urban kind of living. And I wonder if just because people are living in a simpler way, does that automatically entitle them to that state of consciousness. For example, in the time mm. of the Buddha, everyone was living in that way. Um, mm -hmm. But it was arguably a bigger job for the mm. Buddha to go around and try to spread this newfound state of consciousness to people. They all had the same problems then it was we this, have today. I mean, it was the same problems in a, different, in a much simpler, more primitive yeah, form. Yeah, interesting. Um, but arguably now it's easier just because language and information can be disseminated so much more freely. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I wonder if it just hasn't always been the same problem.
Now we come to young Travis, who raises the alarm about the highly addictive and transformative psychoactive medications given to kids in the school in which he works. While these drugs make them more easily controlled and may help them learn, Travis suggests, they are also quite possibly robbing them of the ability to grow into their own states of consciousness, stealing both their future and ours. This is one of the greatest ignored crises of our time, and perhaps it will one day be seen as one of the greatest crimes against humanity in our history. Jacob, Mark, Mikey, and I all weighed in on this troubling topic. Now that I know your circumstance, you know, I'm, I'm really rooting for you. I love you. And I, for you, are like full on impacting the professional world in, in one of its more convoluted, contorted yeah. environments, which is the, the school environment and the parents and everything. Like, I want to be your, your counselor, your backing guy to say, <laughs> no, you are not going crazy. It's a crazy world. Yeah. I mean, you could come back here and, unload this happened that happened that happened and say and i don't believe in any of it and we say we don't believe it. we're we're with you man and maybe here's how you navigate because if you want to be in that world it's going to take kind of a hard shell over here a soft touch over there and internal energy mm -hmm. and strength and then you're going to break through because you're going to have pushed through all the dysfunction of those environments and you're going to maybe establish your own practice or something. You can create a more sane thing. Yeah. But it's going to take years of tilting at those windmills before you can do that. So you need people to support you if you're going to take on that mission. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> if those kids need you and those parents need somebody like you. Rose. Honestly, I feel like it just brings me down a lot some of these cases. Like, right now, during this whole talk, I feel like I've been very, like, pessimistic. And, uh, like, this weird energy. It's hard to cope with seeing so much suffering, yeah. like, all yeah. the time. <laughs> all the time. So you're, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but you're bringing power and wisdom. I mean, if you've really seen that, you can bring wisdom and insight to us or to anybody. Yeah. Right, because there's plenty of other people that are joining the field that you're joining that might just kind of do the status quo of treating the symptoms yeah and getting at the root of that stuff especially with childhood issues and trauma is like yeah pretty heavy in general the good thing is like kids are pretty resilient yeah so there's a lot of room for improvement but yeah. You, yeah. you see trauma that will take years to, for someone to deal with if they can yeah. ever deal with it and and, and some of the other professionals, or quote-unquote professionals, probably have learned to put up walls and yeah. just not get involved, whereas you're empathic. Actually, it was brought up in one of my classes this week. It's this, it's this phrase called effective resonance. It could also be like uh, said as empathic resonance. Mm -hmm. It's like the environments that you're in, like the people that you're around. You. Literally, your nervous system begins to mirror those. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. And vice versa, too, you know, I think that's probably how the therapy, that's part of how it works. So, what do you do for finding help with the suffering that you experience? That's a good question. I'm not really doing anything about it. I should be seeing a therapist right now. Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, self-care is like a very, that's the term in the therapy world, self-care. It's like mm -hmm. you're supposed to be engaged in self-care. You know, like I go hiking and I've been creating music. That's a big part of my self-care. Mm -hmm. Are there any groups amongst the therapists themselves that basically interact with one another? And yeah, actually, yeah. And like, for example, my um, practicum class, it's a support group, pretty much. It's like me and a bunch of my other classmates. We present our cases and like talk about them and support each other. I don't know. I, I feel like actually, actually I've been pretty lucky compared to some of my classmates. One of my friends, he, he had a chair picked up and hit across his face and then wow. the kid kicked him when he was on the floor. Mm. <laughs> uh, so compared to that, I haven't had to deal with anything like that, but, you know, it's support for, like, stuff that comes up, you know? Part of the reason why I discontinued my therapy was because it's so expensive. $100 an hour, I don't have that kind of money. And also, it forces you to encounter things inside yourself that are so hard to see, and so hard to acknowledge. It's just, like, 
too much sometimes. So burnout sounds like yeah. a real possibility problem. Yeah, yeah, burnout is a very large percentage of therapists burnout after a couple of years. Mm. Especially after getting licensed. I don't want that to happen to me. <laughs> what age yeah. kids do you work with? Um so it's mostly it's elementary school. We work at the school through the agency. Mm. Um it's elementary school. So oldest is like 10, maybe 11. Yeah. Do they come to you as a counselor or, or where how do you work? So basically I take them out of class at some point during the day and then we go to the um check room and then we just do play therapy or some other kind of therapy usually kids that young are not talk therapy is not effective mm -hmm. because their most of their world is like worked out through play or drawing or whatever and the issues these guys have do you have a sense i mean do some of them are they biological in origin or they mm -hmm. come from family issues uh, well, you know, that's a really funny question. Either, do you have any insight? I mean, you don't, you really probably don't even know. You just know there's an issue. And... Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm one who is inclined to not attribute something to like a biological, because if it's like biological, then pretty much what you're saying is the only way to treat it is with drugs. I'm one who is not inclined towards that kind of. I mean, that that's that's not true. The brain is very mal yeah. malleable, and I mean. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. You could also ask the question of what's not biological. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So I don't know. I I feel like, okay, something that I feel like very torn about is like, I have several kids who are diagnosed as ADHD. Mm -hmm. I think ADHD is extremely overdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. My supervisor diagnosed me with ADHD which I was pretty weirded out about for a while and maybe a little bit still am. You know what, I'm just going to kind of drift on this yeah. river of thought that I'm kind of following here. After my supervisor did that, she's just like, oh yeah, so yeah, that's because you're ADHD. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, no, she's like, no, I'm serious. So then like I went out and tried Ritalin or not Ritalin, Adderall, a friend suggested to me and it's like, showed me like these drugs that we're giving these kids literally like addictive very addictive mm. substances wow. Wow. <laughs> what yeah. do they feel like to you what, what do they do to you uh okay so I, I never tried adderall before that instance it's like caffeine but like not it's definitely a stimulant i don't know like it's hard to describe you feel like you can do anything you feel like it's speed it's dextro right <laughs> right dextro amphetamine exactly your th thoughts are racing an immense ability to focus your mental right exactly energy. something that I felt kind of disturbed about was honestly I felt like I was very manipulable just in talking to people like I felt like I was very suggestible to whatever they had to say um, part of where I'm coming from with that is on this day that I took this Adderall I interacted with both a car repair person and a banker and a couple other people that kind of made me feel like this. I feel like in some way these kind of drugs that are given to these kids are just to make them like easily controlled. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's always necessary. One of the kids that I work with, he's got some serious stuff going on at home and they want to diagnose him with ADHD. Uh, I think it's kind of crazy to like assume that it's coming not from the stuff going on at home but from some kind of purely biological condition like that you need to give them drugs for it instead of addressing the family situation and then on top of that, it's addicting. <laughs> in my head, when I took the Adderall, like, I was thinking in my head, oh my gosh, this is like, I could get so much done if I had a prescription. I'm gonna go get a prescription tomorrow. I'm gonna do this immediately. I need to do this. <laughs> but, the, like, I think, wow. but I think that's why it really demonstrates that it's way over prescribed because my understanding is the whole concept is that for people that really, really do have intense ADHD, yeah. which one of my good friends growing up when I was in elementary school, yeah ended up having pretty serious case of ADHD really clearly. Yeah. And if they take that, the dopaminergic effect of it is that they actually calm down. Yeah. If we take speed, we're going to, like you were saying, racy thoughts and all that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it is way overdiagnosed. I think that there could be legitimate cases of ADHD that would be treatable with medication. So really what one of the things that points out is all these kids are on Ritalin and Adderall and stuff like that, how do they, in their early brain development, how do they come out as human beings? Are they able to access okay. 
yeah. cognitive function, spiritual, profound self, are they going to be locked in to how this is conditioned? Well, I mean, the thing is, it's dextroamphetamine. It's addictive. I don't know everybody's experience, but from my own experience, I wanted more. It felt good for no reason. Like, if you were taking it for an extended period and then stopped taking it, you would probably feel suicidal, depressed, etc. The state of consciousness that a lot of these kids, even the ones who are supposed to be like legitimate cases. I see a kid who's supposed to be a legitimate case of ADHD. He talks like, I've heard this term, chatterall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they just want to talk. I, I saw him yesterday and we were walking back to his classroom. He was just talking, talking, talking. We were like literally at the door and he's like still talking to me. The teacher's like telling him to come in and he wouldn't stop. That drug fixates you on what you're doing. It's like so like the manic mm. monkey mind. Mm. It's like so extreme. What happens to that generation when they're... Well, they've turned up? into good little robots. Yeah, <laughs> but it's into... also the side effects. I mean, yeah. blood pressure increased. And, yeah. Mean, it's not good for your body. Yeah. I mean, I guess Adderall is worse than them. So Ritalin, do, but... do they, are they extra users of technology and smartphones and stuff? Well, the whole generation, like the younger generation is... <laughs> you think that maybe they're good cubicle big screen workers because of this or is that a wrong assumption that they're that that fits them hand in glove into the 24 7 tech kind of culture chatter culture oh, you mean like the like adderall is adderall. the drug of our time because i think yeah like adderall and caffeine are the drugs of our, our time yeah caffeine caffeine yeah coffee caffeine. i wonder when, when did those amphetamines when did they begin to be prescribed i i, I haven't heard of like Five years out, 80s. ten years out. So the I wonder. 80s? Well, what, yeah, it's been 25 years, really. So the kid, I, I, I'd be so interested to, to hear a longitudinal study looking at, you know, the eight-year-olds and ten-year-olds and twelve-year-olds of the 80s yeah. that were prescribed that, where they're at now in terms of these various metrics in terms of their relationship. Maybe we to their live substances. in their world. Yeah. <laughs> we live in their world. Yeah, but well, there was yeah. also cocaine. I mean I, I think there have I think... lots of other stimulants and that would happen. They started Twitter. They started Twitter, yeah. <laughs> and Google and everything else. Well in the in the homebrew club it was, you know, lots and lots of Coca Cola. I mean that was the kind of drug that drove the homebrew uh, culture. <laughs> yeah. And, and large swaths of the world. Well, yeah. well, yeah. You know, you gotta wonder what would happen if you allowed kids like that to chew cocoa leaves. You know, mm. what if, what effect would something like you know a very mild sort of constant level of stimulant in their system? You know, would they get any benefit from that and be mm. using something so, that's very really natural? What if you relaxing. taught kids like that meditation? The future of our religious practices in whatever we want to call the future ideal culture of not ideal but like the culture that we hope we're merging into it's more balanced but we're still exploring all this technological or uh, social communications modalities and but with psychedelics as these powerful tools that some of us use occasionally as kind of change agents in our life but for the most part our culture encounters them without any training and preparation you know like we don't have years of meditation I, and i don't know like i really feel like and i know alex gray has talked about this and he says you know he didn't start till later mm -hmm. mostly because he was just not attracted to it at first because he was depressed and it just makes sense to me that eventually if they are legalized you know hopefully in the next 10 years or whatever and there's a lot of scientific research that comes out about all that that really reinforces all the benefits and and also kind of helps paint a better picture of how to use them. Um, if we inspire and create cultures where youth, before their rites of passage with these larger change agents, really do actually do a lot of practice, but also just like deep exploration of themselves endogenously first, mm -hmm. and really build that up. Because mm -hmm. if you just have your first experiences, you know, at a fucking Skrillex concert or something, or, you know, <laughs> I mean, like... I mean, it's probably going to be epic, but, or maybe a little scary too, but, you know, I think that's why a lot of these major DJs and stuff, when they get really big and, you know, it sounds like super drugged out music in some ways, you know, say, oh, I don't, you know, recommend using drugs. And it's like, well, why is your music so hot, man? Here's another thought for you. Roll back the clock to 1957. 
and the precursor experience for kids that are 12 years old was TV. It had roared into American homes in the previous five years and lots of refined sugar. Hmm. So, I mean, they called cereals sugar puffs I mean, right. just to sell them. I mean, <laughs> we don't name cereals this way anymore. And all these incredible refined food diets and TV dinners and all this sort of stuff coming in and the whole suburban lifestyle. And those kids went on to drop acid. Yeah. Well, their precursor environment was that. And so it's almost like the precursor drugs, visual drugs, you know, intake drugs, sugar is one of them, predispose you for certain more powerful drug mm -hmm. experiences later, whether they be trying to pull back from that and go into a deeper spiritual practice or going higher. So in our generation, we've got monster energy drinks, you know, Red Bull. Kids are getting their hands on Red Bull when they're 12. Galen's nephew, like, managed to get a six-pack of Red Bull, and he was so incredibly high. I mean, he was like... He drank six of them? Well, he, he drank, like, one every night because it was, like, the greatest experience of mm -hmm. his life. And because it's the <laughs> first caffeine that had ever been in him, and it was a really potent thing. And uh -huh. Galen talked to him on the phone saying, man, that is a powerful drug. Make no mistake. That is a drug. You know, that is not a normal thing when it hit your system. And that's like a gateway potentially for him to go now into other things and look for more highs. So you've got that, right. you've, you've got Twitter and constant cortisol, brain stim, brain stimulation, pumping out um, adrenaline, just bing, 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 constantly all day. So then it goes into the music, which is a lot like that. And then the drug scene and these research chemicals, like the guy that was running around symbiosis, the guy said, oh, somebody just gave me a little bit of this to, to help like, boost me from something else I took. And he said he was crawling on his face for 12 hours. Like he was God. on the ground. I mean, he, just, he said I was reduced back to brain stem. Like the reptilian <laughs> brain stem was the only thing that was going. And then in comes ayahuasca, which is a whole different thing. But what I'm trying to point out is Today we have this branching structure coming from the kid who took a chemical journey. The kid who took Adderall was, was dosed with Adderall when he was 10 and, and all the way up. JC, our friend, was diagnosed at age two and a half with a, a fatal cancer. And he went to a research program at Johns Hopkins University in which there were 30 other kids after four years. He was the only survivor. They wow. all died except for him. Wow. And he, literally his entire world from two and a half to about age six was pulling his IV drip on a rolling stand and visiting his friends, going to the play corner, etc., etc. And his mother was diagnosed with cancer at the same time and was in the same hospital so he could go up and see her and she died. So in the end, he was just left. They would pump different research chemicals into him and he would kind of gauge what they were. His entire life had been about what chemicals do to you when they pump through you, including an entire mm -hmm. IV bag of something so caustic that the other kids didn't survive it, but he did. And so this is this consciousness that he comes into the world with. And yet many young people are coming in through this chemical consciousness that isn't just Coca-Cola and, and coffee and stuff. It's massive and the research chemicals and the pharma is... But it's an interesting thing to see humanity by the 20-teens and the 2020s. What are we going to be when we're wearing augmented reality? There's this thing that's going to start happening, these implant things, where you can get an implant into your head. It's almost like a miniature fMRI implant and it watches brain activity. And then there's the implant that's giving you the drug. And it's directly giving you the dose based upon your fMRI activity. So if a seizure's coming on, it immediately adapts for the seizure. So there's a complete closed feedback loop. So in a sense, this is heading toward that, this chemo, neuro, pharma, a complete concoction that flows through the bloodstreams, the serotonin uptake you know, receptors, and we're going to become chemo being, but mediated by a ton of visual stuff from technology, a ton of embedded technology. We're going to be undistinguishable to ourselves in the 2030s, 2040s. 
Here's another story that just popped into my head. It's about a billionaire that visits the beach at Goa in India. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting around on the chair and he notices this a fisherman who's coming in with his nets. And he's just got one little boat and he manages to pull in a catch that goes up to the local resort that he sells his fish to. And then this guy watches this fisherman for several days and then finally corners him and gets to talk to him and starts this whole long spiel about, man, you've only got one boat. You've only got one boat. Your fish are great, and this resort could use more. If you had four boats and you could have a fleet, you could build a company, you know, like I did. You know, you could then go on the stock market in Mumbai. You could then do this. And then one day, you may be able to come and spend time here on the beach and go on this <laughs> resort like me after 30 years and four divorces and... And all this stress, but then I found my way here. And the fisherman looks at him and says, but I'm here every day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's... So going in this long path that we're going, you know, the, the species is going chemo, pharma, neurologically. Society will have to just completely remake everything. They could have just taken parts from when Rome collapsed. They took parts from wherever, like different societies and rebuild every part of the world right now like is taking on capitalist industrial society i was reading in the news yesterday shanghai is completely covered in pollution like to the point where it's an extreme health warning you don't go outside otherwise you risk mm -hmm. choking to death mm -hmm. when every society and like all the indigenous societies have been eradicated which is kind of pretty much what's happening or has happened what cultures do you draw on to like rebuild that like but, what, where do you draw your your new culture from you have to just just make it out of yeah. nothing it's almost like in in nature you have the apple tree and the apple tree is mostly dropping its fruit and it, the fruit's rotting underneath it's in the shade it can't germinate but there's one outlier apple that somehow gets kicked farther from the tree or picked up by a bird or pooped out by something and then it is in a new land. And it's almost that it maybe nature is willing to sacrifice a huge amount of offspring to get one germ going to a new place. So it's like if we're heading toward lock in, which is something I'm going to put in a future podcast, that the future isn't catastrophic, it's not apocryphal, it's lock in. It's almost worse. It's like everyone lives in the, the chemo neuro socio lock-in in the system we're building which is comprehensive and it can feed itself you know there's not a problem with resource but there's no way out it's like the great science fiction novel themes where everybody lives in the dome and they're all kind Logan's of run. you know every time you have an extreme you have a group you know it's the yin and the yang you have a group that's willing to put the energy to to go to the other side so the learning occurs by the fact that the ones that run from the dome know completely what the dome is at this point and they they have a discipline and they have energy and they have vision and passion such that they can get out of the dome and encounter whatever and if the dome is doomed or if the dome just goes on it's locked in then nature has succeeded it has produced another step of evolution it may be cultural evolution or psychic evolution or just sheer wisdom was gained. I think the the question you asked a couple uh, rounds ago about this what do you call it chemo neurological uh, um, which uh, which I, I I think what you're pointing to has a lot of validity to it and I think the question of what's that leading to is interesting and, and this this whole locks in concept I think is interesting also and I think that this chemo neurological thing these are all feedback loops that were increasingly bringing closer and closer and closer to to something they're tighter and tighter and tighter mm -hmm. feedback loops and the question is what are they optimized for what are we driving towards and right. it's no different than what's already happening it's just a much more potent mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. visceral a manifestation of it but it's driving towards something and i think the question of what it's driving towards is the deeper thing here because this locked in concept is only problematic if what it's driving towards 
is, we'll call it out of balance or something. But if what it's driving towards is balanced, then you're no longer locked in, which is in a sense the opposite of freedom. You can be driving towards freedom because this notion of locked in versus not locked in is independent of conditions. Uh, There are monks that lock themselves in caves and in boxes and are more free than most of us will ever be in our lives. That's how they started the Pashna, was putting people in jail cells. Hmm. So the hmm. wow. this this locked in thing is I think it's more in the end what state of consciousness are these feedback loops driving us towards? Hmm. Um, that's all that's going to matter, anyways. Yeah, and I think that that that's a question of where this sort of societal push for consciousness moves mm-hmm. to. And uh, yeah. why yesterday I finally said enough already. I'm going to go and plant sixty pink lady bulbs. You seem like a poster child for that sort of problem. Uh, I am. Are we all becoming locked in as heavily mediated chemo neuro techno beings far from nature and our roots as indigenous people? Or as Mikey asks, could this all actually be driving towards some state of balance and freedom? If you have a story of yourself or your friends thriving or withering on prescribed psychoactive medications, drop us a line at www.levityzone.org. And stand by for the soon-to-be-announced Levity Zone salons and cyberspace, where you can join in from anywhere. William Saul family again brought us this episode's intro and outro music, and Jacob Amon crafted our cover art. See you next time on The Levity Zone.